time, we saw that evolutionists are trying to pretend that evolution of life from non-life has nothing to do with evolution. Why would they do that? Until recently, everybody accepted that the evolution of life from non-life is the obvious and only beginning for biological evolution. After Stanley Miller put some gases in his apparatus, passed electric sparks through them and produced amino acids, the scientists of the world told us that life created in the laboratory was just around the corner. But we're still waiting. What went wrong? Well, for a start, some complex molecules are essential for any known form of life to exist. The two best known of these are called polypeptides, better known as proteins, and polynucleotides, better known as DNA and RNA. Poly means many. Proteins are chains of many amino acids, sometimes thousands of them. DNA is made of very many nucleotides, sometimes millions of them. But both amino acids and nucleotides come in two forms. One form is the mirror image of the other form. They can be right-handed or left-handed. But although both amino acids and nucleotides always form in mixtures of roughly half right and half left-handed, proteins only work if all of their amino acids are right-handed, and DNA and RNA only work if all of their nucleotides are left-handed. The popular reports of science can give the impression that this is not a big problem. Mineral surfaces can sort them into left and right-handed forms. But what they don't tell you is the amount of skill it takes to find out what minerals will work for which molecules and how much work it takes to prepare those mineral surfaces. A typical preparation involves meticulous cleaning of the surface by two sequences of washing, first with deionized water, then with ultra-pure methanol, then with methyl chloride, then with methanol, then with deionized water. After all that, the mineral surface will cause about a 10% enrichment of the hoped-for molecules. But the slightest contamination like just one finger having accidentally touched the surface, leads to no enrichment at all, and we need 100%. We're not usually told about that, and not surprisingly we find people thinking such a thing could happen out there in the world supposed to be full of volcanic ash and meteoric debris. Other mechanisms have been proposed, but all of them turn out to need strict control of events which only, ever, occur in a laboratory, under the constant supervision of skilled chemists and technicians. If a way is ever found to actually solve the left-hand-right-hand -hand problem in realistic, supposed early Earth conditions, then the enormous problem of assembling those nucleotides into long strings of polynucleotides would have to be solved. There have been proposals for making strings of RNA using clays as catalysts, and quite long chains have been produced. That sounds easy enough. You can find clays all over the world. So here we have a process which could have worked just about anywhere. RNA chains could have formed wherever you find clay. But when you look a little deeper, you find that only one kind of clay works, Montmorillonite. Now, that's a clay I know very well. If you look at the trailer for this channel, you'll see me working with Montmorillonite. 
trying to find out why it leads to all the known tests for clay content, particularly the hydrometer test, giving totally unreliable results. Montmorillonite has a very high cation exchange capacity. That means that it can readily lose some cations and grab others to take their place. It has a structure which leads to very high electrostatic forces in its crystal lattice. Those electrostatic forces draw in hydrated cations. That means ions tightly bound to water and that allows it to have major and powerful changes in volume. It can be used to break very hard rock. Very useful. But it can and frequently does break buildings and infrastructure. The properties of Montmorillonite depend on the cations in its structure. Calcium ions reduce its expansive power. Sodium ions increase it. It can contain all sorts of ions. Each one affects its properties and it's quite happy to take up an interlayered structure with other clays like illite. But none of the Montmorillonite I've ever dealt with would work for those origin of life experiments. It takes a very special kind which comes from one source in Wyoming and it needs a special kind of treatment, among other things, the copper iron and zinc ions have to be removed or else it won't work at all. So it turns out that it won't allow RNA chains to spring up all over the world. It can only happen with a special clay which has been treated in a laboratory by capable scientists with special equipment. On top of all that, they have no idea how those RNA chains could acquire any information so they'd be useless for life anyway. Well, the origin of life people have had very limited success with finding out how life might have happened on the Earth. So they've been very busy looking for extraterrestrial life. Before we look at that, it might be as well to look at a problem of scientific arrogance which can cause confusion. Way back in 1807, a Swedish chemist called Jons Jakob Berzelius studied chemical compounds found in life forms. He found those chemicals of life all contained carbon. They also contained hydrogen, oxygen, sulphur, nitrogen and phosphorus. That chemistry was unlike what had been found in non-living material. So he called this kind of chemistry organic chemistry. And everybody else called it organic chemistry too. But 20 years later, a German chemist called Friedrich Wöhler found that he could make a compound called urea, which occurs in living organisms, from ammonium cyanate, which is not found in living organisms. It was later found that all sorts of fairly simple chemicals found in life can be made from ordinary chemicals. And of course, Stanley Miller found out how to make amino acids with gases and electric sparks. So chemists should have looked for a different name for this kind of chemistry because it does not only apply to living organisms. But they didn't bother, and this is a source of confusion to anyone not in the know. The branch of chemistry dealing with carbon compounds is called organic chemistry, even though much of it has nothing to do with life, and includes things like deadly synthetic poisons. Secular scientists are confident that life must have emerged on vast numbers of planets in vast numbers of galaxies throughout the universe. They tell us they've identified organic compounds in distant clouds of gas and dust, 
they found organic compounds in meteorites which have landed on the Earth. Among those organic compounds in some of the meteorites are amino acids. Astrobiologists like to give the impression that they could have come from extraterrestrial life forms. But to have come from a life form, they would have to be right handed. Some have been found to be about 10% more right handed than left handed. But it's been found that the nearest to the centre of the meteorite, the smaller the percentage excess. So this could be due to contamination since landing on Earth. There have also been found some processes which can make the percentages go up and down a little. For a life form to work at all, it has to be 100%. The search for an extraterrestrial origin of life has not produced much joy for the searchers. You may remember we met Harold Morowitz in episode 61. He seemed to have abandoned the conventional search for the origin of life and was looking for ways to coax the simplest chemical pathways in life, the citric acid cycles, to develop in complexity. He pointed out that the hope is that when a full theory is available, we will see the formation of life as an inevitable outcome of basic thermodynamics, like the freezing of ice cubes and the formation of magnets. Well, more of it's died without finding any new laws of thermodynamics. But others have carried on trying to get those same cycles to give them some clues to the origin of life. But even for the reverse citric acid cycle, which some very simple bacteria used to convert carbon dioxide into organic compounds, 11 steps are involved. Each step requires a specific catalyst. Of course, the bacterium has enzymes which do the job very efficiently. But on the supposed early Earth, there were no enzymes. There were minerals that could work, though not very efficiently. But how likely are you to find 11 different minerals in just the right place to do the job? And how do the reagents pass efficiently from one mineral to the next? Who knows? Morovitz died without finding any clues. I suspect anybody working on this will die before finding any clues. And I think we can forget about finding those new laws of thermodynamics. Origin of life research is floundering on all fronts. One new idea is to bring in all sorts of disciplines to help find a solution. Philosophers, mathematicians, information scientists who might have some suggestions to point the crumbling search in a new direction. And then again, the new scientist points to a very different idea. Life didn't slowly arrive from non-life. It must have happened all of a sudden in a chemical big bang. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.